won't hear it, but if you watch it, you will. Hey, everybody, here we are. We are now live. Hey, uh, my name is David Krug, and uh, I am an assistant, or I, I'm not an assistant anymore. I'm a full professor. I just became full professor uh, this summer. So now I command the respect that I'm due. Um, I've been at JCCC. Uh, this is my 11th year. I'm very exciting, excited to be taping these videos, okay? For you folks who are watching these at home or on YouTube, uh, we taped Accounting One videos back in fall of 2011. Uh, everybody thought they were taped earlier because the music before the videos was so cheesy. Uh, but those Accounting One videos that are on public YouTube were, were taped in fall of 2011. And I get emails from people all over the world that watch those, and they always say, when are you going to do Accounting 2 videos? When are you going to do Accounting 2 videos? And I kept telling them, oh, we're not, we don't have any plans to do that. Well, we finally decided to tape Accounting 2 class, which is what you are watching now. So we finally said yes to the public demand. It's kind of like the Star Wars movies. They just kept begging for more Star Wars movies, so now they're making more Star Wars movies. It's just like that. So, um, a few introductory things. Uh, this is actually lecture two z number 202. Lecture number 201 uh, is the lecture that I will tape in regards to class policies and procedures. But I decided to number these videos differently uh, than my accounting one videos because uh, I wanted it to, I didn't want somebody to watch uh, accounting uh, lecture number six, and then they went to lecture number seven, but it was for accounting two, and all of a sudden they're all mixed up. So I made the numbering very specifically different. So uh, this is lecture number 202. Lecture 201 was class policies, policies and procedures, and there was, there was no lecture 200 or 199 or anything like that. Uh, the other thing I want to say real quick and remind everybody is the textbook that we are using for this class, okay? The textbook we are using for this class is, oh, let me just put it on the overhead, okay? It's Fundamentals of Accounting Principles, Volume 2, Chapters 12 through 5, by Wild, Shaw, and Chiapetta, and it is the uh, 21st edition of this book. And there's a picture of a very lonely man that went to the lake and is on his iPad, which I think is kind of sad. So, uh, but if he didn't spend so much time on his iPad, maybe he would have friends with him at the lake. <laughs> um, but the I, I'm going to go ahead and do a real close-up here for those of you who watch this uh, on public YouTube. There's the ISBN number of this class, okay? And if you want to go purchase this, okay? So there is the ISBN number. A uh, common question I always get is, what textbook are you using? Well, like I said, it's the 21st edition of Fundamentals Accounting Principles by Wild, Shaw, and Chiapetta. Did it, was everybody able to get that book? Okay, good. Um, the other thing that we did real quick here, and I want to talk about is, does anybody have that? Can I show this real quick? We took a quiz here in class, and go ahead and just, sh I will talk, but just go ahead and leave this on the screen as I talk. One of the things I like to do is um, ask my accounting two students, I give them this quiz to see if they still remember what accounts are debit balance accounts, what accounts are credit balance accounts, okay? so. I asked them these questions. If you want to pause that, folks, and uh, you, you folks at home, and, and take this quiz to see how well you did. And here are the questions I asked on the second page. Once again, you can pause it if you would like to see if you know the answers, okay? But you need to get most of these right. And if you don't get most of them right, then maybe you need to go back to that chapter one, chapter two, maybe chapter three of accounting one and review your account balances and, re and review what financial statements accounts go on because that is very important, okay? We presume that you have that knowledge, okay? Just real quick, let's go through this so we all know the answers, okay? 
Accounts receivable is a debit balance account. Consulting revenue is a credit balance. Advertising expense is a debit balance account. Automobile is a debit. Capital is a credit balance account. Salaries payable is a credit balance account. Cash is a debit balance account. Unearned revenue is a credit balance. That's a liability, right? Unearned revenue. Owner's withdrawal is a debit balance account. Prepaid rent is also a debit balance account. Okay? Now, for you folks here, this is version C. So if you have version D, these are in a different order. On your Scantron, how would you indicate how each of these accounts change? Well, how do you decrease accounts receivable? You credit it, don't you? How do you decrease withdrawals? Well, it's a debit balance account, so we have to credit it to decrease it. How do you increase advertising expense? You debit it. How do you increase capital? You credit it. How do you decrease equipment? Equipment is a debit balance account, so we have to credit it to decrease it. And how do you decrease consulting revenue? Uh, we debit it. Is that correct? Is that what answers you all got? Okay. And then quickly, what financial statement do these items go on? Okay. Well, unearned revenue is a liability, so it goes on the balance sheet. Depreciation expense is uh, an expense that goes on the income statement. Total revenues goes on the income statement. Taxes payable is a liability that goes on the balance sheet. Withdrawals goes on that statement of equity or statement of owner's equity. Accounts receivable is a, an asset that goes on the balance sheet. Interest earned is a revenue account that goes on the income statement. You with me? Okay. Questions on that? So you folks who are watching can kind of assess uh, how you did on that. And if you know that information or perhaps you need to review it. Now, does anybody remember what type of account that we mainly talked about in Accounting 1? What type of company, I should say, not account. What type of company did we talk about? Very good. Sole proprietorships. There was one owner, only one owner, and they did not incorporate their business. It was a sole proprietorship. That was the main type of business we talked about in Accounting 1. Well, in Accounting 2, we are going to talk about partnerships. Okay? We're going to talk about partnerships. Okay? And uh, let's talk about what a partnership is. Now, do you guys all have these slides here in class? Okay, good. You folks at home who are watching this online, these are on the website in the appropriate section that I have showed you. Okay? All right. Let's talk about the partnership form of organization. Okay? First of all, the partnership form of organization is voluntary. You cannot make somebody be your partner in a business, right? Just like you cannot make somebody marry you or something like that, right? Uh, it is voluntary. There is also a limited life, okay? Coming off that real quick to the cameras, let's say that uh, Daniel and Michael had a partnership, okay? Well, let's say you have a landscaping partnership. Well, if one of you would die, heaven forbid, that partnership would be over, okay? Now, you might opt to go into partnership with somebody else, but the partnership between you two guys is over, okay? Just like if you're married to somebody and one of the spouses dies, that marriage is over. You can get remarried, but that marriage is over, okay? So it has a limited life, unlike a corporation, which has an unlimited life. Co-ownership of property. What does that mean? Well, co-ownership of property means that, Daniel, if you, uh, if you put a truck into the business, uh, Michael can use the truck as well. You're not saying, well, this is my truck, okay? Uh, the, 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 the partnership now owns that truck if you, if you truly invest it into the company, okay? What you have is a partnership agreement, or what you should have is a partnership agreement. Now, what is a partnership agreement? Well, this is usually done uh, with the help of an attorney. And what it does is it's a written document that explains, like, how will income and loss be divided, okay? Um, 
how, uh, what will we do if somebody wants to withdraw from the partnership? Uh, what will we do if somebody wants to bring on somebody else in addition, as an additional partner? Uh, what will we do if we have cash troubles? It tries to walk through those what-if scenarios while everybody still loves each other so that they know what to do if it comes to that time. So it's basically a contract between two people. Yeah, it's so you, you can paper. think of it as a contract. In a way, it's like a prenuptial okay. in, a, in a marriage. Now, um, when I got married 24 years ago, we didn't have a prenuptial because we didn't own anything. I think we would have just decided who got the Atari game system or whatever if there was a divorce. That was the only asset we had. But you hear of movie stars that say, hey, I love you and I'll love you forever. But in case we get divorced, this is how it's going to play out, right? Okay. Um, and while I'm not a big fan of prenuptials for, for marriages, uh, I am a big fan of partnership agreements for uh, partnerships. Okay. Now, these, probably, these don't cost that much to do with an attorney. They probably cost about a thousand bucks. You know, depending on how complicated everything is. But what do you think the number one reason that people uh, do not pay the money to get a partnership agreement? They can't agree. They what? They can't agree on a partnership agreement. Well, that's usually not it. That might be, but if that's the case, well, <laughs> then you might you may not even want to go into business with that they person. Trust the other partner. And so yeah, they say, you know what? We don't need a partnership agreement. We don't need a partnership agreement. We'll just talk things out. We'll work it out, right? Um, and that's, that's all seems kind of ideal when, when things are starting out. Does anybody, uh, has anybody uh, have a friend uh, that's been through a messy divorce? Okay, anybody? Nobody? Well, wait a few years. You'll know some people. Uh, maybe you know some people who have gone through a messy divorce. But I have friends of mine who's gone through messy divorces. And I can think back to when I was in their wedding. And they were standing up there in the church, and they were looking at each other's eyes and holding their hands and saying, I will always love you, you know, as God has given you to me and me to you, and we will, you know, run through the forest with butterflies and rainbows, and everything's going to be wonderful. <laughs> and they ride off in the Cinderella, you know, horse and carriage and happily ever after. And they just, everything's so full of love on that wedding day. And then three years later... They're divorced and they're going, I hate that person's guts, right? Well, sometimes partnerships are like this. When you start a business, you're like, this is going to be great. We'll just talk out our problems. Everything's going to be great. But then when troubles come, you may have wished you had invested into the partnership agreement. You with me? Okay, cool. Another characteristic is of partnerships is mutual agency. What do we mean by mutual agents, agency? Um, and that's usually discussed in the partnership agreement. But what that means is this, is going back to Michael and Daniel again. If you guys are in a partnership, um, let's say you're in that landscaping business, Daniel, you can go to you know, uh, the landscaping store and buy some grass seed or something. You don't have to have Michael with you. You can act as an agent of that partnership. Okay. And this makes sense, because what if all 13 of you were in a partnership together? When you go buy office supplies, would you all have to get on a little school bus and go to, you know? Certainly, individuals can conduct business for that partnership if that business is reasonable for that type of, of a business, okay? And certainly buying, you know, grass seed or something would be a reasonable expenditure for a landscape company, okay? All right, now let's talk about real, two real important items. One great thing about a partnership is that the partnership itself does not pay taxes. Now, does that mean that Daniel and Michael get to, you know, live the benefits of a tax-free life? No. What that means is this, is the business itself does not have to pay taxes, okay? Now, let me clear that up a little bit more if that's still fuzzy, because now what we're going to talk about is a corporation. We're just going to, quick segue, quick side note, let's talk about a corporation. Now, a corporation, you got a corporation here, right? 
Oh, thank you. You guys are quick. All right. Uh, here you have a you have what is called Sprint Incorporated, okay, and they are a C corp, okay. Well, they have to pay taxes. The company itself has to pay taxes to the U.S. government, okay. Well, then, after they pay those taxes, they may give some money. to their shareholders, okay, uh, in, the, in the form of dividends, okay? Well, those shareholders, or those owners of the company, those stockholders, they also have to pay taxes to the government. That is one, two, double taxations for C-Corps. You see what that is? And Sprint hates that they have, have this. The owners of Sprint, the shareholders hate that they are paying taxes on money that Sprint has already paid taxes on. That's double taxation. Okay? But going back to a partnership, one of the big advantages to a partnership is the partnership itself does not pay taxes. Your business will fill out what we call an informational tax return where there's no money or anything, and then you'll just... Uh, report whatever you need to on your individual returns when you do your individual for you or your family and that's when you pay your taxes. You're only taxed once at the individual level. Make sense? So that's a great thing about partnerships. Now let me tell you the big bummer about partnership form of organization is there is what we call unlimited liability of partners. Unlimited liability of partners. Well, What does that mean? Well, coming off the cameras, to Daniel and Michael, let's say you have that landscaping business. Well, you, in your partnership, you have unlimited liability. So let's say Michael is uh, foolishly texting while he's mowing a lawn on his riding lawnmower, and he runs over a child. <laughs> That's under, that'd be a bit messy, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, the partners could come sue the partnership and try to take the partnership assets, but they could also come after your personal assets, Michael. They could take your home or your lake house, or they could go after your savings account that you funded with grandma's inheritance or whatever. So you can't LLC a partnership? No, we'll talk about that. This is what we're talking about is a true, pure partnership. We'll talk about that in a second. Now here's the real bummer about a partnership. Let's say that Michael has this very unfortunate lawn mowing accident and you're a partnership, he doesn't have any personal assets, but Daniel does. Guess who they're going to come after? Boom, boom. So that is a big, big disadvantage of a true form of partnership. You with me? All right. Let's talk about a couple of other organizations that have partnership characteristics. Now, there's something called a limited partnership. This is where you have general partners who conduct the operations of the business, okay? But you also have what is called a limited partner or a couple of limited partners. These are individuals that are partners of the business, but they are not in the daily operations. Maybe they're just the money person. Like maybe you guys decide to bring on Jeremiah because he has lots of cash. He's a limited partner. You two are general partners, okay? Now, in every limited partnership, you have to have at least one general partner to conduct the operations. But limited partners, such as Jeremiah, they, uh, they have no personal liability beyond whatever they've invested. So in that unfortunate lawn mowing example, they could not come after limited partner Jeremiah and take your personal assets. You with me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing that maybe you've heard of is a limited liability partnership. Now this is a partnership, however there is protection in regards to malpractice, malpractice or negligence claims amongst the different partners. Now when you see words like malpractice or negligence, what types of partnerships would you think you would find the LLP form 
to be in existence? Medical groups. Medical groups, like doctors and also attorneys. Okay. So let's say that there were five of you that were in a uh, doctor's office together and you were each physicians and you were an LLP. Well, they could not, if, if Henry has negligence, they cannot come after somebody else and go after your personal assets. You with me? So there's that, there's that protection because we know doctors, they're getting sued all the time. Okay? So there's got to be uh, that, that sort of a form to kind of protect them from those sort of claims. Okay? Now the next form of business is what you were referring to, Michael. Have you ever heard of the Limited Liability Corporation, or sometimes called the LLC? Well, the LLC has kind of the best of both worlds. The owners have limited liability. So they, they do not have to worry about somebody coming after their personal assets. And the business itself does not pay taxes. It's the best of both worlds, isn't it? So if you were going to start a business today in the United States, I would reckon to say that they would probably advise you to be an LLC because it's these two great benefits. You might ask yourself, why doesn't every company be an LLC? Well, the main reason is, well, let me back up. We're talking about these different forms of business for accounting class. If and when you guys take a law class, you're going to go a lot deeper into these forms. I don't know all the legal stipulations and requirements and all those for each of these forms. But in a general sense, the main reason that not every business can be an LLC is there's a certain size or a certain complexity that once a business grows to, they are not allowed to be an LLC. Are you with me? I don't know what every little legalese thing is. But Suffice it to say, a company like PepsiCo or Sprint, they would love if they could be an LLC and no longer have double taxation. But they are way too large and way too complex to qualify to be an LLC. The reason the LLC was mainly put into place was to provide an avenue for small businesses to be able to start and have both advantages of no double taxation as well as limited liability. Cool? So does the government set that up, like what the max is as far as the... Yeah, and the government <coughs> establishes that. Again, if this were a law class, we'd go through the, 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 you know, the stipulations as of what you have to do to qualify as an LLC, but it's kind of beyond the scope. Okay? I mean, it's just like a form of insurance, more or less, right? Well, you can think of it that way, even though it's not technically insurance. But by being an LLC, the main reason people do it is so that they have that protection if there is a lawsuit. And we know in the United States, everybody likes to sue everybody, right? That's how you make money. So, all right. Uh, I had a business for five, 10 years, and I was an LLC. And it's really not that expensive to do. You have to pay a few fees. There's a few things you have to do, forms you have to fill out. But it's really not that complicated at all. So if you were to like start like a branch of an already like existing company, like let's say you want to open a Starbucks or something, do you have stipulations through that company already that you have to... Starbucks, I guarantee, is a, C co is a corporation. Okay. And so that would be a franchise. So it really wouldn't technically be its own separate entity. You'd be, you'd be a franchise. Now, I take that back a little bit. If you own like several Starbucks yourselves and had a franchise, I'm not sure. I think the protection you would receive would be from the corporation itself. Okay. But maybe you could be an LLC as well. Again, if you guys ask me real legal questions that are kind of attorney type things, I'm not going to... I'm not going to know. I just didn't know if like, you'd have like, like pre-made stipulations to have to be, like you'd have to follow. Like you couldn't well, Starbucks and any sort of franchise definitely has a list of things in place to protect you, but also a list of things that you have to do to qualify to be a franchise. Okay. okay? All right. Let's just kind of, let's just generalize here and move beyond this. Um, take a look at this chart. Let me get my pointer. I'm not really good writing with a mouse. Uh, proprietorships are what we talked about in accounting one, okay? Partnerships is what we're going to talk about in chapter 12, okay? And we're going to kind of just touch on a little bit of these as well. An S corp is real similar to an LLC, okay? And then there is what is called a corporation or sometimes we call it a C corp, 
okay? That's like sprint. And we'll talk about that in chapter 13, okay? Now, regardless of how you organize your business, it is going to be a separate business entity. Now, remember the business entity concept from Accounting 1? You're going to keep those records separate from your personal records, or if you have more than one business, you keep everything separate. But looking at this chart, in regards to a legal entity, only items that are a corporation, whether an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp, are a separate legal entity. Okay? That means you have almost created an artificial person. Corporations have rights and responsibilities. They can sue and they can be sued. Okay? So only corporations are separate legal entities. Limited liability, as I said, partnerships and proprietorships do not have limited liability. They have unlimited liability, which is a real bummer. Is the business taxed? Only a C corporation has this double taxation. Okay? And lastly, is one owner allowed? Well, yeah, any kind of business can just have one owner unless it's a partnership. Okay? If you have a partnership, there's more than one owner. But uh, coming off of that, you know, this, whenever you think of corporations, you probably think of like PepsiCo or Garmin International or Hallmark. There's a lots of corporations that are just two people. There's more of those than the others. Okay, so I don't want you to think corporation always is a gigantic. You could be a C-Corp if you wanted your, two, your two-person landscaping business. You could be a C-Corp, but I'm going to guess your attorney would advise you to be an LLC. All right. We're laying some groundwork here. Um, remember how when in a sole proprietorship in Accounting 1, uh, going over to the document camera, uh, remember how we talked about, like, in a sole proprietorship, accounting one, uh, John Doe. You can't, you can't see it. Oh, man. Come on, Krug. Okay. <laughs> John Doe invests cash of $10,000, and then we credit capital for $10,000. Remember how we did that in accounting one, and that was the journal entry? Well, a lot of times, we didn't even put the, the, the partner's name behind their capital account, okay? But one thing that I want you to know is in a partnership, each partner has their own capital account and each partner has their own withdrawals account. So there is an account called Capital Dan and there's a capital called, or there's an account called Capital Michael. And there's an account called Withdrawals Dan and there's an account called Withdrawals Michael and you keep track of that separately. Does it make sense? And just like with a sole proprietorship, you as owners can invest assets and liabilities into the company, and it increases your capital. Okay? Just remember in Accounting 1 where I made a big deal about how investing assets into a company and net income are the things that increase your capital? And the things that decrease capital are the owner taking assets out of the company, or if the company has a net loss, those decreased capital, remember that? Same way with a partnership, except that you each have your own capital account, you each have your own withdrawals account. Let's take a quick look at this. Um, Bob and Jane on May 1st organize a partnership. Bob Let's contributes... See the computer. Oh my goodness. Switch it. Grandpa gets... Grandpa's getting older, okay? Thank you. All right? I'll get used to this eventually. All right. On May 1st, Bob and Jane organize a partnership. Bob contributes cash of $19,000 and equipment of $4,000. So we debit cash and equipment for $19,000 and $4,000. Notice we don't put Bob's name by it or anything like that because the <laughs> partnership co-owns it. And then what do we credit? Well, we credit capital Bob, okay? Or sometimes people put the name and then capital. They put Bob, comma, capital. Either way is the same. Not too hard, is it? Well, let's say that Jane contributes cash of $3,000 as well as an automobile with a fair market value of $24,000. Now, there's a note payable of $6,000 that's due on the, that automobile. That's also assumed by the partnership. What would that journal entry look like? Well. 
I always say just list all the assets and or liabilities going into the business and then ask yourself, well, what do we have to credit here to make this journal entry balance? Well, in this case, we have to credit capital Jane for $21,000. Of course, your total debits have to equal your total credits. Make sense? If there's withdrawals, if Bob withdraws uh, $3,200 from the partnership for personal expenses, the journal entry is the same, except we debit withdrawals for Bob. Credit cash. If Jane withdraws $2,900, we debit withdrawals Jane and credit cash for $2,900. Make sense? Okay, I've yacked long enough. What I want you all to do is just, just take a few minutes and I've given you a Lucinda and Donna handout and I only want you to do requirement A and B. Just requirement A and B, okay? Now you folks at home who are watching this, if you're an online student, you should have all these work papers. And if you're watching these overseas or somewhere just watching these for your own benefit, if you email me at the email address that is given many times throughout these lectures, I will send you these uh, handouts, okay? Don't leave me a comment on the YouTube page. I don't, I don't read those, okay? Uh, send me an email. So let's just take a few minutes while they play that snazzy jazzy JCCC music and let's do requirement A and B of the Lucinda and Donna handout, all right? Okay, we are back. Let's take a look at the answers to this. Uh, you can just, I'll, I'll talk, you can just leave the camera on this. Well, um, there's cash and equipment uh, for Lucinda invested into the business of $4,036.80. So we credit capital, I just put L for $7680, right? Okay. 
For Donna, uh, she put in cash of 8820, vehicle of 9800, and a note payable of 2300. Okay, now you might ask yourself, well, the partnership doesn't want any notes payable. They want, don't want any debt. Why would there be a debt that they take on? Well, they're more than happy to take the vehicle, even if there's some debt, because, I mean, would you take a $9,800 vehicle even if there was $2,300 owed on it? Sure, okay. So you don't get one without the other. So the vehicle goes in at $9,800, the note payable goes in at $2,300, and then we credit capital for Donna for $16,320. All the debits equal to credits, right? Debits equal to credits. Cool? Questions? All right. Let's go back to the lecture. Now, let's review the closing process. Remember chapter four was for us in accounting one. Remember when you closed the books at the end of the period? What you had was, first you would close the revenues, wouldn't you? Okay, by, by debiting them. And they'd be for some amount. And let's say the total over the revenues was 100,000. And remember how we would credit income summary? And then we would close the expense accounts, right? You'd close all the expense accounts. And let's say the total of the expenses in this case was uh, 60,000. So we would debit income summary. And then does anybody remember the third closing entry? Close the capital. You would close the income summary to capital, capital right? And now do we have a net income or a net loss here? Well, the revenues are 100,000, the expenses are 60. Income. So we have a net income of 40. So what that third closing journal entry was in accounting one with a sole proprietorship is we would debit income summary for 40,000 and we would credit capital for 40,000, right? Now, it's the same way with partnerships. And of course, you have to close the withdrawals account too. So, but just know that, but let's concentrate on this. This is all the same for a partnership, except we have more than one capital account now, don't we? So we might have capital for Daniel and capital for Michael. And we need to know how that income is allocated between those two partners. Are you with well, me? Those revenues and expenses, would you put like, let's say like it was like an expense that like Daniel paid for, would that be no, a difference? Or? For, for where you are in your education, no, it's an expense of the partnership, okay. okay? But we need to know how to divide up that income summary. Now, where do you think we would go to find out how we divide up that income between partners? Income statement? No. Partnership agreement. Partnership agreement is where it's gonna state. Now, if you don't have anything written down, it's gonna be divided equally. But I wanna talk about now is how we divide income or loss, okay? We don't report salaries and expense on the income statement for partners, okay? The way that they're compensated is, uh, you know, through their capital account increasing and being able to draw on that. So, again, if the partnership agreement does not state how to divide up income or loss, then it will be done equally but there's some other ways it can be done. Now, I want you to look real quick, switching back to this doc cam. When we do this entry to divide uh, or allocate the net income, there is no cash being, sometimes people will incorrectly credit cash here. No, 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 no. This doesn't mean we're, we're giving out money to the partners. This is, we are increasing their capital accounts. Does that make sense? If they choose to withdraw cash in the future, that's their prerogative. But when you are allocating net income or net loss, it is not a cash transaction. You with me? Okay. Just like in accounting one, you didn't credit cash uh, in that third journal entry when you closed income summary. Okay, let's talk about the different common ways to divide income or loss. Um, two of these are just pretty straightforward. The third one needs a little more explanation. Okay, what if we divide it based on a stated ratio that's listed in the partnership agreement? Let's look at an example. 
Smith and Jones agree to divide profits or losses for three quarters for Smith and one quarter for Jones. Now why might, coming off that real quick, why might net income not be allocated equally amongst partners? Maybe one's doing more work than the other, or they put in more initially. Great, great answers. Maybe one is doing more work than the other. Maybe they, uh, we'll see in the, the second way to allocate net, uh, net income. Maybe somebody has put more assets into the business. Maybe somebody has more expertise, right? Okay. Um, Henry, if you wanted to start an accounting practice with me, I would probably say, well, I have more experience than you do, right? right. So I'm going to get more than that income. And that's just the way it is, right? LeBron James does not get paid the same amount on his team as the 12th guy on the bench, right? He has more skills. So in this analogy, Henry, I'm LeBron James, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, let's go back to this example. Smith and Jones agree to divide profits or losses, three quarters for Smith and, and one fourth for Jones. For the current year, they reported net income of 60,000. Well, I mean, it's pretty easy to see how we came up with those numbers, right? Three quarters of 60,000 is 45 grand for Smith, and then of course the 15,000 is one fourth of 60,000. Make sense? There's no cash distributed or anything. This is just how their capital amounts, amounts uh, accounts increase. And you can see here they, they put the person's name and then capital. I usually go capital and then the person's name. It doesn't matter. Questions on that method? Let's look at the next method. What about an allocation based on capital balances? Well, Smith's capital balance before division of profits or losses is 80000 and Jones is 40000 now the partnership agreement calls for income or loss to be allocated based on the relative capital balances. Net income is 60,000. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, so you have the capital balances for Smith and Jones. Smith is 80, Jones is 40, it's a total of 120. Well then we figure out the ratio. What's 80 divided by 120? It's two-thirds, or 66.67%. What's 40 divided by 120? It's one-third, or 33.33%. Okay? So we just do a little allocation there. Then we take that, uh, that percentage times the net income of 60,000, and that gives us how much we allocate to each partner. Does that make sense? And then, of course, the journal entry looks like this. Right? Now, this, this method might be used, remember when you, uh, uh, when we invested assets, this would reward the person who has a higher capital balance, perhaps from investing more assets into the company. Correct? Okay. Any questions on those first two methods? Let's look at the third method and what, what time we have left. All right. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is a perfect example of something that's going to be best illustrated by doing an example or two. So we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, let's say Smith and Jones have a partnership agreement with the following condition. Smith receives a 15,000 salary allowance and Jones receives a 10,000 salary allowance. What is a salary allowance? A salary allowance is simply a number that's written in the, uh, in the partnership agreement in regards to doing the computation that we're going to do. Now Smith gets a $15,000 salary allowance, more than Jones's $10,000, because perhaps he has more expertise. Okay? Now each partner is also allowed an annual interest allowance, and it is going to be computed as by taking 5% times the beginning of the year capital balance. And remember from the previous slides that the beginning of the year capital balances for Smith and Jones are 80,000 and 40,000. Okay? So they're going to receive an interest allowance of 5% based on those beginning of the year capital balances. And then any remaining balance of income or loss is going to be divided equally net income for the year is 60,000. You're probably going, what? 
Let's take a look at an example to clarify. We have a net income of $60,000. Well, the first thing we need to do is list out the salary allowances that were given in the partnership agreement. It said that Smith will receive a $15,000 and Jones will receive a $10,000 salary allowance. So write that down. Then it says they receive interest allowances of 5% of their beginning of the year capital balances. So for Smith, that would be 5% times 80,000 equals 4,000. And for Jones, that would be 5% times 40,000 equals 2,000. Are you with me? Okay, so now we add up these four numbers here, and those numbers add up to 31,000. You with me? We subtract that from the net income of 60,000 and we get 29,000. And then how did it say we divide that balance? Equally. Equally. It's not always equally, but it is in this case. So what's half of 29,000? It's 14,500. So we put 14,500 for each partner. Now we add these three numbers up and we get 33,500. Now we add these three numbers up we get 26.5. Now the key thing in this is you need to make sure that the 33.5 plus the 26.5 equals the net income of 60,000. If they don't add up, if those two numbers on the bottom line do not add up to the net income, then you've made a mistake. You with me? So in, that is a little more complicated way of allocating income. It's one that grants certain salary allowances to each partner based on their knowledge or expertise or how much time they're putting in. And it also rewards them by keeping a high capital balance because there's a percentage paid on that, which is the interest allowance. Is that the most common way used? This? Oh, I don't think so. Actually, the most common way is probably <coughs> equally. But this is certainly used a lot. Okay. okay. Now, taking a look back at that screen. The journal entry would thus be a debit to income summary for 60000 and Smith Capital, Jones Capital is credited or increased because it's a capital balance, it's a credit balance account. Those accounts are increased for 33.5 and 26.5 respectively. Cool? Now I want you to note something. We have about three more minutes here. If we change the net income, let's say the net income instead of 60000 as in this slide, Let's say it's 81,000. Well, I want you to note that everything here stays exactly the same, no matter what the net income or net loss is. But now, if we subtract that 31,000 from 81,000, we get 50,000. What's half of 50,000? 25,000. Now we add those up and we get 44,000, 37,000. Does 44 plus 37 equal 81? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay? So everything in that circle stays the same regardless of the net income or net loss. Well, what if they only had a net income of 22,000? Well, once again, everything in the circle I'm drawing now stays the same. But now you, d you subtract that 31,000 from 22,000. What's 22,000 minus 31,000? It's negative 9,000. What's half of negative 9,000? It's not 4,500, it's negative 4,500, right? Add those up. Does 14,500 plus 7,500 equal 22 grand? Yes. One more example. What if they had a net loss? Or you could think of it as a negative net income. Well, let's say their net income is a negative $9,000. This is all the same. Well, what is negative 9,000 minus 31,000? Negative 40. What's half of negative 40? Negative 21,000. And you add those up, it's negative 1,000 for Smith, negative 8,000 for Jones. That adds up to negative 9,000, right? Okay. Um, and in this case, your capital accounts would actually be decreased, okay? Capital Smith, 
capital Jones and income summary would be credited, okay? Because it's a net loss, all right? Make sense? Cool. Okay, come off that real quick. Um, here's what I want you to do for homework, okay? What I want you to do for homework is Okay, I want you to finish the Lu Lucinda and Donna handout. Then I want you to do what I call the Scott and Mike handout. You folks here, I'm going to give that to you here in just a second when the, when the cameras are done. And then what I want you to do is Quick study, QS stands for quick study. Do quick study 12.1 and exercise 12.1 and 12.4. Are you with me? Now the Mike and Scott handout, which or the Scott and Mike handout I'm going to give you looks a little like that. This is not three separate plans. This is all the same plan, and you're only going to make one journal entry here, just like we did when we are doing this right here, okay? So the homework I want you to do, finish the Lucinda and Donna handout, do the Scott and Mike handout, do quick study 12-1, exercise 12-1, exercise 12-4. And if you need to review those account balances and what goes on what financial statement, go ahead and do that as well. We'll see you guys next time, bye.